Welcome to the first video on the Life by Lex channel. I'm really excited to start making videos and I don't know what took me so long. I think it's just laziness. Not sure. This channel is going to have a lot of different content. It's Life by Lex. I do have a blog that is titled Life by Lex and I really want this video to be about everything. It's Life by Me. Um, my name is Alexis. I'm 28. I live in the boring state of Delaware. I have an 8 to 5 Monday through Friday desk job. And I have a love for film, singing, makeup, a lot of different artsy things. And I figured, why not start off my channel with the first post that I ever posted about on my blog, which is the title of this video. So, I have had three miscarriages in the past year and a half. It's never a fun topic to talk about something as serious as this. And I feel like it's really important to spotlight how common miscarriages are, how my personal experiences, but also this video is to fully show it's for people who aren't really educated like I was in miscarriages and you know it's just to bring awareness there's not enough awareness with miscarriage support there's not enough um there's not a much that there's not there's not as much heart in the world either and I thought it was really important for the first video on my channel to be about me, about this particular topic, and we're just gonna dive right in. I'm not going to draw this out any longer. Um, if you enjoy the content, again, this is my first video, but I will be having several reviews on products that I enjoy, um, makeup, updates with my fertility, um, I'm a very big on mental health awareness, so that'll be another thing that I want to talk about on my channel when I get lenses that don't have glare in them. That'll be another video. It won't. Um, but yeah, we're going to dive right in. So, if you like what you see on my channel, please feel free to subscribe because as you can see, it'll say zero when you hit the subscribe button and if you ring that bell you'll be notified of when I upload which I'm not sure how frequent that will be because I just am drained mainly by this topic I have been with my current boyfriend for five years we're not married but we're pretty much um we're partners you know for life at this point and we never, these were not planned pregnancies, but they also were pregnancies that we 100% were rooting for. We were rooting for these babies to make it to full term, and we were rooting for being parents and supporting each other and really wanting to start a family in that moment that you find out that you're expecting. And I don't have anyone in my immediate family that I'm aware of that has had fertility issues. This to me was my first really large slap in the face with it. And it really, for me personally, I'm not going to make general statements. For me personally, I was never really introduced to, if you get pregnant, there's a possibility you could lose the baby because I never had anyone in my family that experienced issues with this. And my grandmother popped out 17 children and my mom popped out me and two other women. And you just don't think about stuff like that. Definitely something that, you know, is a reality clearly by my story. 2018 in April, um, I found out I was pregnant for the first time, and before I found out I was pregnant, me and my boyfriend had been together for four years and never had this happen, and it just so happened that I was. And 
you know, I didn't know what to think. You know, it's the common like, holy crap, like I'm not ready. I'm not this. And me and my boyfriend had just taken a break at the time and I wasn't living with him. And the timing just seemed all wrong, but I'm pro-life. And it definitely was something that we were going to take seriously, whether we were together or not at the time. And I didn't think anything of it. I'm like, okay, I'm going to be a mom. That's the image that's just been portrayed all my life. You get pregnant, you give birth, and you have a child. And um, I started bleeding, which very early on, I was seven weeks when I started bleeding. Not heavily, but enough to make me concerned. I went in for an ultrasound the day before I miscarried, and the, you know, you look up images of what an eight-week baby should look like, and there was no baby at all in my stomach. It just looked like a sack, and that's all it was, and they said I looked like I was underdeveloped, and I, again, had no education. I was like, okay, I'm underdeveloped. Cool, so everything's fine. The next day... I started bleeding heavily. Um, I went to the hospital that night and I basically just soaked up my, you know, my pants in the waiting room, went to the bathroom. My boyfriend got there in the bathroom with me and it was just a bloody crime scene. Um, and I was just this video just a disclaimer will be very graphic because i do want to paint the whole picture it was clots it was huge clots just pouring out huge clots just pouring out and i didn't know what to expect you know the doctor comes in and there's like there's a possibility it could just be hemorrhaging you know it doesn't necessarily mean it's a miscarriage and I was naive and just like, okay, yeah, you know, I'm emotional, but I'm like, okay. Um, they take me for like the official ultrasound and they're like, you know, she comes in and she's like, I, I'm, you know, I'm sorry to tell you that you did miscarry. And I was a wreck because again, you have that image in your mind. And I've always been a maternal person in my life. I've always been in that position of not trying to be motherly, but it's like an instinct for me. So being a mom is something I almost feel like is built in me. So to find out that that just is over with is devastating, even if I didn't see a baby on the monitor. And that was really tough for me to deal with. I, you know, and then in just telling people, you know, the response is always, if you if you need anything, let me know. But it's also... Because there was no baby, because there was no full-term life that you gave. It's just, you know, I'm so sorry to hear that. And then those people disappear. You should be fine. There was no baby. You didn't give birth. And that was my first taste of it. Um, and it was really rough. I do suffer from anxiety and depression on a daily basis. And that did not help anything at all. Um, especially going through a breakup with my boyfriend. And just you know trying to navigate through what in the world do I do now like what do like I don't get it like what happened and you know, doctors just normalize it they just they normalize they just say you know miscarriage is the first time happen and that's it there's no recommendation to get testing done there's no recommendation to get anything done because it's normal Women have miscarriages the first time all the time. There's a high percentage. That's not reassuring at all. But again, naive as I was, I just said, okay, all right, you know, it is what it is. Um, I do seek therapy still to this day, twice a month, my favorite therapist. And I was in a different place of depression because I lost and that was very helpful for me and you know I went through turmoil for the past couple months after that kind of dealing with you know are me and my ex getting back together or we're not getting back together like so you know typical relationship things 
I'm totally lying. It's not typical relationship things, but that's not what this video is about. Oh, that was the first miscarriage, you know, turmoil throughout. Um, again, I miscarried at eight weeks and that was around June of 2018. And, you know, I went through July, August, September, October, November, December. It was very, very rough just with other things with my ex, but January finally came, we made the decision to be back together and found out I was pregnant again and was a little afraid, but I was like, you know, they said the first one's totally normal. So this one should for sure, for sure, everything should be fine. Like, right? Like there's no question about it. It should totally be fine. And went through everything. I went for an eight week ultrasound and I actually saw reptile baby and <laughs> actually saw a baby didn't look like a baby obviously that early but I saw a living being inside of me with the heartbeat and everything and it was a completely different experience than my first time so I for sure was like this is amazing this is going to stick this is so it's a completely different feeling and I am a heavy set girl if you can't tell I'm a very heavy set girl. Well, not very. Let me not like make myself sound like crazy, but I'm pretty heavy. Like borderline 200 pounds. Working on that, by the way. And I have stomach rolls. I mean, I have rolls. So being pregnant, I mean, I really, in any of my pregnancies, never got that pregnancy bump because I do have fat there. So that also made the experiences that much more unfair for me. But getting back to this one. So at eight weeks, I had my ultrasound. Everything was going good. And then at 14 weeks, you know, of course, you deal with the typical pregnancy symptoms. So nausea, this, this, and this. And I'm a comfort eater, you know, stress eater. I love sweets. I love carbs. I love just all the bad stuff. And that's all the stuff I indulged because I was like, oh, I'm pregnant. I can totally do this because, you know, duh, you're supposed to when you're pregnant. 14 weeks, I go to hear the baby's heartbeat and strong good to go you know in 15 weeks i um oh okay this, this is where it's like uh difficult okay so i'm at work um for the past week i was experiencing some cramping in my lower abdomen but they tell you that's normal okay just, you know, drink a lot of water, you're probably dehydrated, you should be fine. So this was March 27th of this year, 2019. And I was in my 15th week, I was past the first trimester, I'm like, yes, we're good. Um, the cramping starts getting a little bit stronger than ligament pain, as they say that you have when your uterus is expanding. And I'm looking it up and I'm like, okay, you know, it's fine. You know, they said if it's really, really, really like unbearable, go to triage. But it, you know, you should be fine unless you're bleeding. And I wasn't bleeding at all during this pregnancy until that day I was at work. And I felt, you know, continued really bad cramps and I went to the bathroom and wiped and there was a little bit of blood and it wasn't as graphic as it was the first time, but there was a lot of blood. I mean, there was blood. I'm not going to, I, I didn't want to ignore it because something just didn't feel right. I go to my manager's office, I'm crying, I'm like, I'm sorry, I have to go to the hospital. Like, you know, I'm really concerned about, you know, the baby and... She's like, okay, you know, I get my boyfriend, we go to triage. Um, so the doctor comes in with the portable ultrasound machine on wheels and goes over my belly. And because I only had the one ultrasound of this baby looking like a reptile, this was the second time I saw my baby in an ultrasound. And the baby looked like a baby. And I wasn't even at the time paying attention to what we're looking for. Like I wasn't like, oh, there's 
the baby's not with us anymore. I was just like, oh my God, there's the head and there's this and there's that. Oh my God, this is amazing. Like, this is like, I was just wrapped up in that, seeing that my baby actually looked like a baby. Where my Sean, Sean, my boyfriend, and the doctor were looking for a heartbeat. And, you know, after her going, you know, for a couple minutes, you know, around with the ultrasound she then says you know what let me have you go actually get like in a vaginal ultrasound because you know sometimes these machines you know I'm just not finding a heartbeat but sometimes these machines are you know but as soon as she left the room Sean was like that's not good and I was like what do you mean he was like I saw her face she she didn't find something and I was like, no. So I got a little emotional then, but I'm like, you saw the baby, right? Like you saw the baby on the monitor. The baby's there. Like, what are we having? Because again, just naive, just not educated in miscarriages, stillbirths, nothing. And I go do my vaginal ultrasound. I come out and I'm waiting for like 20, 25 minutes, 30 minutes. And she comes in. The doctor and says you know I'm very sorry to tell you that you know you had a miscarriage you know the baby the baby doesn't have a heartbeat anymore and it was very rough and what sucked the most is I didn't feel the baby kick at all during the pregnancy I didn't feel any movement in the pregnancy didn't even get to see a baby bump to really like to really take in the fact that I was pregnant, you have to just go by a picture on a screen and the fact that you're throwing up. Um, so that was rough. And I basically had to go through the process of getting a D a D and E, which is a dilation and evacuation, which is taking a vacuum inside your uterus and sucking the baby out. So I went the next day and they couldn't see me until a, five days after I found out that the baby didn't have a heartbeat, which is to me very cruel to do because no woman wants to have their dead baby inside of their body for any longer. The, that's, that's, that's normalized that you have to wait days after you find out your baby is no longer alive you have to wait to get the baby taken out of you and I feel like that is very cruel for the medical system to feel like that's okay like I understand like you need to wait for spaces to be available whatever but I feel like that's an emergency you have a dead being a dead living boy or girl inside of somebody else's body and it's just it's cruel to have to carry around your child who's not even living anymore. Like you didn't even get to have a connection, have any sort of anything. And you have to keep him or her in there. <sighs> so, the you know, I obviously didn't go to work. I just didn't feel comfortable going to work with, you know, my baby not alive inside of me. And was waiting for the appointment. And literally the day... The day after, I was told no heartbeat, and I scheduled my DNE for a week after, or five days after. I was laying in bed with Sean, just, you know, we're tired, exhausted, emotional. And I, you know, I was getting really bad cramping still. And I remember laying on my bed, and I feel a really bad cramp, and I feel like something drops. And a gush of blood comes out. And I'm like, oh my God, I run to the bathroom, I'm dripping everywhere and a huge clot comes out. And I knew it was coming after. And, you know, Sean got up and he's like, what do you need? And I'm like, I'm going to stand up and I think the baby's coming out and I felt a drop, but I felt it like catch, like something was hanging out of me and I couldn't bear myself to, I couldn't bear myself to look and 
I stood up and Sean grabbed whatever it was and walked away. And I was like, was that the baby? And he said, yeah. So he just wrapped baby up in a napkin because, you know, we're talking like that big. And um, I call my doctor. They're like, go to triage right now. And I was like, well, I want to bring the baby, you know, I want to get the baby tested for genetic testing to see, like, you know, if there was any sort of chromosome issues or anything, you know, and they'll test the body. And, you know, we rush to triage. I'm gushing blood. I get to, you know, to check in. I'm still gushing. And, um, you know, I go to triage. I get inside. Um, and I'm just like clots are just pouring out and pouring out and I'm still getting like a really bad cramp and then it pours out a really bad cramp and it pours out and I ended up I ended up passing the placenta and the baby and I couldn't bear I give so much praise to women who have the strength to look at their baby who has passed away no matter how old because there was no way that I could have looked at the baby because the baby had 10 fingers 10 toes a head like say what you want about babies that are born Babies that are born pre, you know, this early. But again, I was 15, you know, a baby is a baby, a life is a life. And that is traumatizing for every, for anyone. And this was March of this year. It's been nine months since this happened. And it's very, very hard to remember because it was a very, very traumatizing time for me and Sean. And Sean has been the strongest through all of this because he was the one that pulled the baby out from me that was hanging and he wrapped the baby and he saw the baby and you know, on the way to the triage, he had the baby wrapped in a napkin, wrapped in a grocery bag, and I was holding the baby, like, to my chest. Um, and I was so tempted to look, but I did not want to scar myself in that way because I'm an overthinker by heart, not by choice at all. And I knew that if I was to see what he or she looked like, that it was going to mess me up more than I already am. So um, they basically took the body for testing as soon as we got there. They took part of my placenta for testing and I went home and I was a complete disaster complete because now it's happened twice now first time is oh okay it happened second time it's now like okay there's something going on and I don't have any medical conditions other than asthma eczema and iron deficiency that's it I don't have anything to my knowledge that would prevent me from having prevent me from not having children so this, again, was another blow to my thought of ever having children. And it was a couple weeks after that that I go in for a follow-up, or I think a few days after. I go in for a follow-up, and he has a report of the analysis from them taking the baby and the placenta for testing, and... I wanted a copy of the report because I am very, I want to see for myself, read it. I want a copy for me. And I'm reading everything and basically it's just saying that, they, you know, they took a microscope to see, you know, how many fingers the baby had, what this, what this, what this, what this. And then I read towards the middle and it had said 
phenotypically male. And we did not know what the gender of the baby was. So finding out it was a boy was like, it changed things for me because the first time and before I found out, there wasn't a significant he, she, it was just it, the, there wasn't. boy girl we had no idea and to know it was a boy hit me like it just happened and I just was like a mess um you know in that they said that the baby was extensively macerated which I had no clue what that meant and looking it up basically the baby had passed in me for such a long time that the skin started bubbling. His skin started bubbling while he was in my uterus and that just happens. And it just made it worse because it just made it like, well, then when did he pass then? We found out he didn't have a heartbeat on Thursday. Friday, he... I passed him and now I'm finding out that he, he was dead longer than a day. <sighs> it's just a lot. I mean, it's, it's a lot. It's just the worst thing. You just feel helpless. You just feel like I don't get it. Like, why did I just lose a baby boy? I don't understand. It. Me and Sean talked about getting tested to see what was going on. Because clearly, we didn't want to have to go through this a third time. And I, you know, we scheduled... I found a different OBGYN. I scheduled an appointment with the fertility specialist. And... Right when we had set for the initial appointment, it was the miscarriage happens in March. So appointment was scheduled for June. June, I found out I was pregnant. And because I had such a rough time with this, with the second loss, I became very envious, very jealous of anybody pregnant, very upset, very, I know this isn't the right time, but I'm going to somehow get pregnant again because I, this isn't fair. And there was just no patience in me to wait because I wanted this now. Like this wasn't something that was on my radar before career, marriage, house, but now it was. And I didn't care about the order. I didn't care about the timeline. I now cared about, I am going to be a mom. I want to be a mom. This is going to happen for me now because it's not fair. And I regret that thought process now because we lost another one. So June of this year, found out I was pregnant, got blood work done. It was confirmed. They had me take progesterone suppositories because my progesterone levels were low. So I for sure was like, third time is the charm. I'm taking suppositories. I have to stick in my vag every night before I go to sleep. This has to work now. Like this is, this has to work. I went in for, I, I was cautious very very cautious about everything I picked up my dog and I was like oh my god could this have caused an issue I feel like I'm, I may be cramping like I was very cautious and who would not be after going through this twice already and we went for an eight-week ultrasound just to confirm that everything was okay because I was scared and we saw I believe it was 10 weeks we went for an ultrasound and again this experience was 
another different one. We saw the baby that looked like a baby, very tiny, and he was moving around like crazy, and it was just a different experience to actually see movement and, you know, a little personality form, even though they were only like 10 weeks old. So it felt again different and I documented everything. I was like, I want, I told Sean, I want you to record everything, even if it's not the good parts, because this stuff I'm going to share if it happens or if it doesn't happen full term. And so that was the 10 week. And then we went for our scheduled 12 week and saw the baby again and got to hear the heartbeat. And again, just moving around like crazy. And again, it was just exciting again. And then here at 13 weeks in this pregnancy, did it get a little tricky? Because we went for a carrier screening, first trimester carrier screening at 13 weeks. And again, baby was up on the monitor and just moving and had the thumb to the mouth. And it was, again, just stuff we hadn't experienced before. And they basically look for fluid buildup in the back of the neck to see if there's a possibility of Down syndrome, any sort of, you know, issue or something, Turner syndrome, just chromosomal, anything. So... They do everything, take their photos, and doctor comes in, and she's like, I'm sorry to give you some bad news, but there's a couple things going on with your baby. First, your baby has a cystic hygroma, which is a cyst formed in the back of the neck, and an enlarged heart. Your baby's heart is larger than the chest cavity. So, you know, you feel like you can't freaking win. Here. It's just, what does that mean? <laughs> Are we losing this one too? It, you, you know, I had so many questions and we had to meet with a genetic specialist who gave us options on what the hygroma could mean and what we should do next. And basically, if the baby has a hygroma, it's a possibility they have Down syndrome. They have some sort of syndrome or it could just be fine and the hygroma could just go away on its own and you're fine but then you're hit with all these different all these different scenarios if we do testing and the baby doesn't have any sort of syndrome or any issue the hygroma needs to go away by 26 weeks and if it does not your baby will die because the hygroma will be so large that they the baby just won't be able to handle it but if you do have a hygroma there's possibility you know if there is something positive with testing then the baby will have down syndrome or the baby will have turner syndrome which you can't nobody can survive with turner syndrome and if it's Down syndrome, you know, this hygroma still has to go down. So everything is depending on this hygroma going down and the enlarged heart is a whole other issue. And it just, it just, again, made me regret my decision to be so quick with you need to get pregnant right now because now we have another issue that we have to worry about. Um... So we did some blood work to test to see if the baby shows positive for anything and got an email from the genetic specialist that said, nope, it looks like all your results are good. If you want to know the gender, let me know because I have that information too. Part of me was going to wait. You know, I was optimistic after that and I said, I really want to do a gender reveal. I really want to, you know, do what I couldn't do last time. But then... I thought I would hate for God forbid something to happen to the baby and I don't find out while I'm pregnant what the gender is. So I just said, you know what, let's just find out. Me and Sean opened up the, I requested it from the counselor. 
she sent it to me another boy so I guess I just carry boys I, I guess no girl for me but it was it was awesome like we were talking about names at 13 weeks like no actually when we got the results it was 14 weeks um so we were talking about names and Sean's like Alexis it's it's kind of early for that and I was like I know but you know you never know let's just talk about this now I was just so excited and that was on a Wednesday and this was in September Wednesday was September 4th, 2019. I had a follow-up appointment on September 6th with my OBGYN for, to hear the baby's heartbeat with the machine, not the ultrasound machine. I go in for the appointment. She puts the thing there, kind of moving around my stomach um, to hear the heartbeat. And she's digging for a while and she's moving it around and she just can't, hear anything there's no heartbeat and she was like you know well, let's go into the ultrasound room because sometimes I have problems with this machine and I'm like thinking already like this cannot be real right like it has to be the machine but part of me was like no not again this can't have happened again so we go into the ultrasound ultrasound room and she does another over the belly ultrasound and you see the baby there's no heartbeat and she's like I don't have my ultrasound technician with me let me send you to a specialist you know because just to make sure because I could just be off today like you know it's a doctor's way of really trying to be nice to console you but realistically they know so I was a mess all the way to the specialist, all the way into the ultrasound room. They did a vaginal and, you know, they have that gray bar that goes over on the screen, you know, to see a heartbeat and there was no heartbeat. These events are engraved in my head now because why, you know? So basically, you know, the doctor comes in and she's like, there's really no way for us to know 100% what happened. We can, you know, take the baby for like further genetic testing, not like the ones you got before. A full panel of genetic testing and I was just like okay but I want this baby to be sent to a funeral home like I want something to remember this baby by I don't want like the last time the doctor just takes it for testing and just completely doesn't even ask me and I wasn't thinking straight at the time what I want to do and just lose that like I have the ultrasound images but just lose that opportunity so this time I actually had a DNA, which was a very you know surreal experience you find out that when they put the vacuum in to take the baby out the vacuum so strong and baby's bones aren't formed that they basically just come out in a pile of tissue. There's no body anymore. So that was pretty devastating to find out. Um, and I had the DNA, I think a day or two after. No, I, it happened on a Friday and I had the DNA on a Tuesday. So again, I had to carry my baby boy in my stomach for three days, four days knowing that he wasn't there so you know it was just such a fog it's it's still a painful fog they took part of the baby for testing and they sent the rest of the funeral home and they gave me a little bag of ashes it's like you know this big and it's obviously not that much because the baby was only 14 weeks but that was emotional picking that up. I mean, this whole thing just feels like you get, it's almost like 
you're getting like something dangled in your face. You know, I'm able to get pregnant, but I'm not able to carry to full term. So you're dangling life in my face and then my body is rebelling against me and it just doesn't seem fair. And after my second miscarriage in this one, I have found a lot of people through Instagram. Pink Elephant is a page on Instagram for miscarriage support. And I think it's really nice to know that there is other people who feels your exact same pain that knows exactly what you're dealing with. There's somebody I was communicating with that has had seven miscarriages. It's just a really shitty situation. And, you know, again, this time I just felt like everybody kind of, you know, said, I'm sorry, you know, for your loss and everything, but kind of just did exactly what you shouldn't do. At least it was early. At least you didn't this. At least you didn't that. And it's like, yeah, those other milestones probably would have been harder, but it still hurts right now. And that was in September of this year. So we're in December. Merry Christmas in a couple weeks. I'm glad that hopefully my story will not only encourage women with these types of similar situations to get tested, but also explain or just share that I have experienced maybe the same if not the exact same issue as you as painful as that is and somehow I'm still here and I'm still trying to be positive and you're not alone and definitely before I got pregnant the first time I was naive to this entire world and definitely felt alone after my first miscarriage because if you're not educated in miscarriage, in neonatal deaths, in stillbirths, you will have the rudest awakening when it happens to you. And it's not fun. Nothing of this part, nothing of this is fun. But that is my stories. And, you know, losing having three miscarriages, losing two boys, it's painful to think about because I am a mom technically to two children. I just didn't get that opportunity and it doesn't even feel like it's a real thing because I didn't actually get to bond with the baby, give birth to the baby, but I am technically a mom and I did lose children and it's not fair. I hope you stuck around through this whole video. If you could, if you were able to, I'm glad that I was able to share my story with you. If you were not able to, this is a shitty situation. So nobody... Not everybody is in the proper mindset to hear something like this, but I really wanted to share. I really want to be as transparent. I hate when people say that word because it sounds so cliche. I really want to be openly out there with my situation. Because if this can help somebody feel not alone, if you need somebody to talk to you about this, if you've had a similar situation, let's talk. Because I guarantee you, I feel the exact same way you do. And if that can help you feel better, if that can help you feel like you have support, then absolutely, I'm glad I did this. That is this video. What I will leave everyone with is... We are in the process of getting tested by a fertility doctor. Full shebang done. I don't want to put it in this video. It needs a whole other video. It's going to be long. It was a month of testing. 
we don't have results yet. That will be in January of 2020. So hopefully 2020 will bring good stuff. But that will be the next video of my fertility journey. It will be what in the world do you do for fertility testing? Like, what is the process? Again, completely oblivious to it before I had these situations happen. You see shows, you see movies, but until you're actually getting poked and prodded, you have no clue what you're in for. So I want to share that. I want to share what Sean has to do, what needs to be done. So... Thank you so much for watching this video. Again, if you liked this video, if you like me, which I hope you do because, you know, I think I'm okay. Please like the video, subscribe to my channel. There will be more videos. Hopefully I don't have a schedule. I can't be that kind of YouTuber and say Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but stick around and I will see you guys in my next video. Thank you. Bye.